Okay. So in the afternoon, we're going to be, uh, at least for this first session, um, shifting focus to the thermal components of the electromagnetic emission and what they're telling us about uh, the mildly relativistic material that was ejected in these mergers. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to first have some talks by the theorists who make predictions for what neutron star mergers should belch out. Uh, then we're going to hear from the observers about what we saw in this event, and then we'll hear something about um, the interpretation in terms of the uh, nuclear sy nuclear synthesis. So, uh, so we're going to have a joint talk here by tag team talk by uh, David uh, uh, Radice, I think. Or yes, Radice. Radice uh, and uh, Dan Siegel on lessons learned from simulations of neutron star mergers. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me start by thanking Brian and all of the organizers for putting together this wonderful workshop. It's really nice to be here and learn about everything that has happened and for having me here. Um, so today my goal is to talk about uh, what we have learned from numerical simulations of neutron star mergers. And Daniel after me will talk about numerical simulations following up the neutron star merger itself. So we kind of divided this talk into two different parts. Uh, following the long standing tradition, we will divide the eject in two parts, one called type one, dynamical ejector, and everything else will be uh, Daniel's uh, uh, talk. So the dynamical eject is uh, everything that's emitted or unbound during the merger itself. This is material that typically comes out in a time scale of few milliseconds uh, from the time the two neutron stars combine. Here you can see a volume rendering of how this ejector looks like. There are multiple components. To make things more funny, I color here things in red. This is material that has high Y, so this will make actually the blue kinonova, or a blue component of the kinonova. While blue material here, this is the tidal tail, this will make the red component. <laughs> so you, you will have to pay attention. The colors are always in bad. So before I get into the ejector, let me start with a brief advertisement. Uh, all of the simulations I'm going to show today have been done with uh, the Whiskey THC code. This is the code I wrote during my graduate studies when I was at AI. This is uh, a more or less standard uh, code to use uh, simulations in GR of merged neutron stars. And I want to advertise it because it's open source. You can go to my webpage, download it, to fix my bugs, and uh, uh, get better results than I do. Uh, also, another thing that I want to add before I get to, to the ejector is that a few months ago I was here in Columbia for another nice workshop on uh, uh, multi-messenger astronomy. But one of the things I showed is this plot showing uh, how we would be able in principle in the future to probe phase transition in high density matter by looking at gravitational waves from the post-merger. And at that time, I said, if we're super lucky and we get with advanced life of design sensitivity, something that's optimally oriented and everything works fine, we'll be able to place a very strong constraint. This is the log bias factor. So you can think that 10 uh, is 5 sigma. Uh, on phase transition for this particular model, this is the appearance of hyperons at high densities, uh, to distances of the order of 20 or 30 megaparsec. But at that time, a few months ago, seems like crazy. And the Einstein telescope, to give you an idea, or a third generation detector, would be able to make the same, uh, place the same constraint to a much larger distance. And the event that we saw, that LIGO saw a few, uh, a few months ago, is actually pretty close. So if we had another event like this in the future, and I think we will have, we'll be able to really probe the equation of state at the highest density, even without having to see the collapse of the hypermass neutron star to black hole, because these curves do not take that into account. We don't assume that we have additional information from electromagnetic counterparts, for example, on the lifetime of the random. So there is a hope that this is the first of many events, or at least of the number of events that are golden events at close by distance. So let, let, uh, let me go back to the ejector, which is the main uh, topic of today's talk. So in the case of the dynamical ejector, there are again different components of the ejector. There's a part of the ejector that comes out 
in the equatorial plane, in the orbital plane, here you see the millennial plane of one of my simulations, uh, density and composition. So you can see there is a component that comes out basically in the plane. This is uh, the tidal field very neutral reach. There's a component behind which is driven by shocks, and there is neutrino driven with a high latitude. Um, so let me show an animation that shows uh, how all of these different ejecta components are uh, uh, emitted during the merger. So what you can see here is again a color code of the electron fraction. Again, blue is stuff that would give rise to a red kilonova, or red component of the kilonova, and red or green would be things that would give rise to a signal in the optical ejecta into space. So this is a simulation I showed just the moment of the merger. You can see the two neutral cells here are starting to shear against each other. And you see a little bit of the tidal field start, start to come out at this time. One thing that happens is the shock ejector behind the region after the tidal tail and the two interact. And at least in this simulation, uh, later on, this neutrino driven wind that starts to inflate the bubble of material that comes out at later time. So what, what can we say from this simulation? So what we have been doing uh, in the past uh, several months, preparation for this event that we actually didn't expect to uh, appear so early, so the, this paper is not out yet. We have been running a very large collection of neutron star merge simulations. We have done more than 50 with nuclear equation of state and neutrinos, and uh, many more with viscous uh, polytropic equation of state, so with simpler models. As you can see from the error bars, we don't particularly trust our data. But there are still some overall trends that we can identify. For example, we can split in a very tentative way. Equations of state in this plane where I show the amount of mass that comes out because of shocks. So this is shock eject against the, just the tidal tail mass. And you can see that soft equations of state tend to live <coughs> in this corner. They tend to produce more shock eject, huh? while uh, Stiffer equation of states so large neutron star radii are dominated by tides. However, if you want to get a lot of ejecta mass, the main message is you have to increase the shock ejecta <coughs> because this is the, the, the channel uh, through which most of the ejecta comes out at the end. So even if you have a very stiff equation of state, it's difficult to make more than a, a fraction of 10 to minus 3 solar masses in my simulations. I wouldn't take this number to be correct to better than a factor of five so, so you can imagine this David spans how do you separate the uh, shock then so in this case I just take uh, uh, a cut in the entropy of the jet okay. I didn't see are there magnetic fields in this this doesn't have, doesn't have magnetic fields uh, magnetic fields will possibly contribute other uh, other outflows at later time this is material that's ejected immediately at the time of merger. So at that time, uh, this equal mass. Some of these were equal mass, some of these were unequal mass, went to mass ratios up to around 0.9. We cannot make initial data for extreme mass ratios. So this is also why probably we don't feel uh, this bottom right corner so much. But the main message that you can take out is that GR simulations do produce a lot of shock ejector. If you want to have a lot of material with uh, relatively high YE, then simulations do five work, soft equations of status. Other sources have pointed out before. At the same time, at least in my simulations, but in the simulations of any group, basically, there is very, there's basically no way to make uh, 0.02 solar masses of shock ejector. So either we are doing something wrong, it's very likely that we change the micro physics, we use even softer equations of state. Uh, maybe with the inclusions of magnetic field, we'll be able to pull out this ejector mass. At the same time, there's probably weak space even in the, in the interpretation of the observations to either push this mass down or include other sources of energy. I don't know. Here I, I, I put jet breakout as a possible suggestion. It's just to say that we don't really know exactly what this blue component of the key comes from. Can I ask, uh, yes. what is the smallest neutron star radius that these equations will take uh, create, for I example? I think the SFHO has something around 11.5. I don't know if somebody can correct me if I remember wrong. There, there are equations of state that uh, reach up <coughs> to two solar masses in the maximum mass that have 
smaller radii, and we are going to do simulations with those next. And it's likely that this will push up the amount of ejecta mass. I was just because I was trying to understand because yeah, like I showed yesterday in my talk. I mean the 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 uh, SPH groups like about spine. I mean they don't get up to ten to the minus two, but they or they 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 can get a quarter ten to the minus two for very yes. small radii. And, and so I don't know. Yeah, we use the same equational state as they do. Um, I think we, we get more or less the same uh, ejecta mass, okay. at least for this particular binary. Other groups get uh, slightly larger masses. For example, the Kyoto groups get the mass which is roughly twice what we get and what Bauss one gets. Um, so there is still space for the simulation just simply being wrong at this time. So I, I wouldn't, you shouldn't take this as uh, a suggestion that there is tension between observation and simulation. This is just a statement that for us to do simulation, we have to do a better job and we have to investigate this more carefully. What is the lowest, what is the lowest mass ratio? I think this was 0.9. Because if you go to lower mass ratio, if you go to lower mass ratio, you're you going to increase the amount more, of thermal yeah, ejecta. You, you may data. reduce a bit the amount of shock ejecta. Right. The problem here is we don't really have ways to produce good initial data with large mass ratios. So we tried to make some initial data, but we don't trust the results from there. So we have to improve the code that generates the initial data before we can do the simulations. Can I ask, how are you putting the equation of state into your higher code? So these are tabulated equations of state. We use the same equations of state that uh, supernova groups use. So these are equations of state where you have pressure and uh, chemical potentials tabulated as a function of temperature. That's but are you, are you producing tables of energy as a function of density, temperature, and electron fraction? Yes. Well, I'm not producing the tables. I'm using tables that others have collected. That we are using the tables from stellar collapse org that Kevin O'Connor put together and also other groups are using them. Yeah, you should be very careful doing that because putting it in that way can be completely thermodynamically inconsistent and lead you to a wrong answer. We put them in the same way as everyone does. So uh, no. There is no other, there is also way groups to do that it. do core club supernova implement the equation of state tables in the same way. I do core club supernova and one of those equations stays mine. That's not the way I do it. All those LS220s are mine. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> okay, well, like, uh, that, that's okay. So in, in the core collapse supernova simulations, they are also implemented as tables, in the same way as we use them in the merger simulations. Um, okay, one of the things I want to point out is uh, if you want to populate, so here I, I show a histogram of electron fraction versus angle for the ejecta uh, coming out of one of my simulations. So, so here in the bottom right, you see material coming. This is basically the tidal state. For this particular equation of state, this is the LS220 equation of state. You have a lot of material coming out in the plane at very low weight. So this is the tidal state. This is the shock ejecta. And this was a simulation that didn't include any neutrino heat. You can see that just with shocks, it's very difficult to populate this area of parameter space, of, of phase space, where uh, you would want to make the blue component of the kilo. But if you turn on neutrino heating, uh, even in a very approximate way, as we are currently have uh, implemented in our code, uh, you immediately populate this region. So the message I want to give here is that this blue component of the kilo is not only a bit difficult to make numerically, but depends very crucially on the treatment of neutrinos. This, this is not so obvious if you look, for example, at the integrated abundances of nucleus in that it yields. If you integrate everything over the whole sphere, there are important differences. For example, if you include neutrinos, you can start to explain elements around the first peak. Uh, but at least in an integrated sense, you always produce these uh, lanthanoid elements. However, if you look just along the polar direction, if you include neutrinos, you actually change the opacities by order of moment. So you have everything that you need to, be, to make a blue component of the alpha flow. Of course, this is a challenge for us to do simulations uh, because Treating neutrinos is, is particularly difficult. You have to treat the full distribution of neutrinos in angle and energy, and currently no one is doing that. Uh, to add on top of this, which is a technical complication, but a major one, there are also things that we don't even know how to uh, describe in equations. One is uh, the effect of thermalization due to turbulence viscosity that changes the structure of the remnant, uh, as we have shown in simulations published a few uh, months ago. And 
can result in changes by factors of a few in the neutrino luminosity. And the other important ingredient is neutrino oscillations, which are expected to, to play an important role for this system, and we have no idea how to treat it. Uh, one good news is that, at least if you are concerned with nucleosynthetic abundances and light curves, the equation of state does not uh, introduce significant uh, uncertainties. So the main effect of the equation of state it will change the amount of mass that you eject, but uh, it doesn't change the final uh, composition of the material. So with that, I will uh, switch, we'll switch to Daniel. We'll talk about uh, secular ejecta. Uh, if there's any burning questions, we'll fold the questions and the answer them to the all right, thanks, David. Um, so with the um, production of dynamical ejecta, the story is not yet over in terms of uh, mass ejection from neutron star mergers. And I'm going to uh, talk about the aftermath of, uh, of the merger, uh, in which we expect secular uh, ejecta uh, being launched and, uh, and ejected from the neutron star merger site uh, on much longer timescales. So as, as David mentioned, these uh, early dynamical ejecta are typically ejected on timescales of milliseconds, maybe up to tens of milliseconds. And these are processes that take place on timescales of tens to hundreds of milliseconds, uh, maybe even up to a second or so. So <coughs> as the two neutron stars merge, and another version of, of, uh, of his simulations here, you see that these neutron stars merge, produce dynamical ejecta, so the shock heated and the tidal ejecta. Uh, but eventually, um, a decent fraction of uh, uh, very neutron rich uh, hot material quickly circularizes around the remnant black hole along the neutron star to form what we call a neutrino cooled accretion disk. Um, and uh, in order to explore the uh, astrophysics and, and physics of, of this post merger system, Brian and I have conducted pioneering really long term numerical relativity simulations of, uh, of this post merger accretion disk over timescales of hundreds of milliseconds in order to follow up this, um, <coughs> this, this system. And in the following and you can, by the way, you can nicely see here the, the launching of, of winds of, of, of disk outflows uh, from, from the secretion disk. And uh, in the following, I'm going to argue that uh, uh, there's actually these secretion disks are able to uh, produce thermally driven winds that are able to unbind a significant amount of material from that uh, accretion disk. And that, in fact, it can be the dominant side of mass loss in, <coughs> in neutron star mergers. We get fairly high ejector masses uh, from this neutron star merger. Um, and these outflows are neutron rich for reasons that I'll explain uh, in, in, in a second in more detail, uh, and are therefore an important site for the R process and also for generating uh, a kilonovae. So in order to do these uh, simulations, uh, we have to uh, code up and package a lot of uh, physical ingredients in order to do what uh, uh, I would say uh, are the first really self-consistent simulations of, of this type, including uh, strong gravity and numerical relativity together with magnetic fields, and magnetic fields are really key here because <coughs> MHD turbulence is really <coughs> MHD turbulence is the means by which angular momentum transport is mediated in these disks. So this essentially sets the accretion rate uh, and therefore um, also the, the evolution of the of the accretion disk. So resolving in particular the so-called magnetorotational instability is really key here to get a self-consistent evolution of the system. As I already said, the material is very hot and dense. So uh, weak interactions become important, so we need to uh, uh, implement them in GIMHD. We also need to have a, at least an approximate way of uh, neutrino transport in order to get a self-consistent evolution of the electron fractions of the composition of the material to get uh, 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 accurate um, uh, predictions for the characteristics of, of these outflows. We need to have uh, a realistic equation of state to uh, describe uh, uh, material. Um, in this case, I implemented the, the Hamel's equation of state that uh, should be uh, valid uh, particularly at the um, comparatively low temperatures and densities of the outflow. So we need some sort of accurate description of those outflows because these initial conditions are very important for the up process, which is very sensitive on, on, on these conditions in the outflow. And in particular, we also need to be able to capture the nuclear binding energy release uh, from uh, nucleons that decompress and form uh, heavier uh, seed particles, in this case, chiefly from alpha particle formation, by which you essentially include most of the binding energy that can have uh, an, uh, an important dynamical effect on the outflow as well. And then finally, at a post-processing stage, we need to couple these uh, results from uh, GMHD simulations to a full nuclear, uh, our process nuclear reaction network in order to follow uh, the detailed nuclear abundances uh, as this outflow undergoes our process nuclear synthesis in order to predict 
elemental abundances and, and heating rates uh, for kilonovi. So in order to understand um, how these disks can actually launch such massive winds, uh, let's look in, into the disk physics in a, in a little more detail. Um, and let's concentrate especially on this, uh, uh, this particular region here, which, is, uh, cont which contains the, uh, the maximum density in the disk, and therefore is sort of dynamically representative for the disk evolution. And let's average some quantities radially over this box and plot them as a, a space-time diagram. So we just radially average of these quantities and plot them as a function of time and position relative to the, um, uh, to the uh, equatorial plane. So you get these sort of nice uh, space-time diagrams. Um, so in the upper panel I'm plotting here the Y component of the magnetic field in the disk radially averaged over this region as I've, as I've shown. Um, so this is essentially the toroidal magnetic field uh, component in, in the disk midplane. And as you can nicely see here, magnetic energy of opposite polarities, of alternating polarities, is generated in the disk midplane uh, that gives rise to this nice so-called butterfly diagram that uh, uh, shows that we are, have a fully uh, operational dynamo here uh, acting in, in the disk. And so this uh, magnetic energy is produced in the disk midplane by MHD turbulence, and then by magnetic buoyancy and pressure gradients, it slowly migrates off the midplane, where it gradually gets dissipated uh, into heat to contribute to what we call the formation of a hot corona in these, in these, uh, at these high latitudes, where neutrino emission, as you can see down here, th this is showing the uh, neutri uh, electron neutrino emissivity in the disk, is, uh, mainly follows the density and the temperature and the, uh, mostly the density in the disk, so it's, it's really confined to the disk midplane. And at these higher latitudes, neutrino cooling uh, rapidly decreases. So what's happening in these, in these, in the, at these higher latitudes is that viscous heating from material that, through MHD turbulence and angular momentum transport, um, gradually falls deeper into the black hole potential, gets heated up. This heating, together with heating from dissipation of magnetic fields, plus uh, the formation of alpha particles, so the release of nuclear binding energy release, is not compensated anymore by cooling. So it's not balanced by neutrino cooling, which shuts off fairly rapidly. And so this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this heating that is not balanced uh, drives thermal outflows from the surface of the accretion disk that can be quite powerful. And they are, in fact, neutral rich. And uh, the, the question now is, like, why are these... What are the temperatures yes. in these disks? This is typically a few MEVs. Um, uh, can, can be up to 10 or even 10 MeV or even a little higher, depending on the disk mass and, and some of the conditions. Um, so speaking of these outflows, um, this shows the, the mass distribution of the outflows as a function of radius where the, these outflows are actually released from the upper corona of the, of the disk. So we see that essentially most of the material is ejected in these uh, sort of inner part of the disk between say a few tens of kilometers up to a few hundreds of, of kilometers from the black hole. And as you can see here, this mass distribution in terms of ejector velocities, you see one uh, important discrimi uh, discriminating feature from the dynamical ejector that uh, David was talking about. So they have particularly low velocities of uh, a few percent of speed of light, maybe up to uh, 0.1 or, or a little bit, of, at least for some tail of the distribution, um, uh, higher than 10% of the, the speed of light. So these, these winds are, are rather slow compared to the dynamical ejector. But why are these ejector actually neutral rich? Um, in, a, in neutral rich conditions, uh, which is what we start with, we have uh, very neutral rich material from the original neutron stars, you would, uh, you would assume that this material uh, uh, at least slowly protonizes and, and, and forms uh, um, a proton, so it raises the electron fraction uh, over time, at least over the time scales of the disk evolution, which are hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and that's actually what you can see here nicely in the upper part of these, of these panels, where I'm plotting the YE, the electron fraction, as a function of time and space, and you can actually see nicely how this YE actually increases, so how this material protonizes. So how can you actually ensure that the disk launches winds over hundreds of milliseconds that are, that are overall, if you average over, the, over all of the outflows, are actually neutron rich? And the answer lies in, in this inner part of the disk, as you can see here, where essentially the electron fraction remind, uh, stays fairly low at, at the order of uh, at least 0.1. So the disk sort of keeps a reservoir of very neutral rich material that, it, that, it, uh, that is ejected into the, uh, the remaining outflows and is, is sort of feeding the outflows continuously with neutral rich material to keep the overall electron fraction uh, uh, fairly low. So why is that? Um, and that has to do with a um, self-regulation mechanism that has been actually explored 
on analytic and semi-analytical grounds already a couple of years ago, but here we've seen really the first evidence for this uh, in, in 3D GIMHD simulations. And um, the reason is the following. So, as I was already mentioning, the two main agents that drive the uh, disk evolution here is on the one hand viscous heating that is generated by magnetic uh, turbulence, so active momentum transport, and on the other hand, uh, uh, neutrino cooling. And neutrino cooling is essentially produced via these processes here. So you have the charged current interaction, so electron positron capture onto nucleons, you have pair annihilation and plasma decay. All these processes generate neutrino uh, radiation that emit energy from the system and thereby cool, uh, cool the disk. So in conditions in the inner parts of the disk where essentially these two processes of viscous heating and neutrino cooling are roughly balanced, you, uh, you can find the following mechanism. So imagine that whenever the disk enters a regime in which the electrons become degenerate, then you'll have fewer free electrons and protons <coughs> available, which reduces the YE, that's something you can, you can show. But if you go back to these, these uh, processes here, if you have less free electrons and positrons, then these reactions will lead to less neutrino emission, so less energy leakage from the system. And that, of course, raises the temperatures, and that, again, lowers the degeneracy. So whenever the disk is pushed into a regime in which the electrons become degenerate, they tend to self-regulate themselves into a regime of mild electron degeneracy. And that goes together with um, a low electron fraction. And that's exactly what you can see here, where I'm plotting this normalized chemical potential of the electrons that is self-regulated um, to order unity. And that really goes together with this low YE interior um, of the disk. And that is essentially launching, uh, keeping a reservoir of, of neutron rich material that feeds the outflows with, constantly with, neut uh, with uh, neutron rich material. And that brings me to our process nucleosynthesis. So, how does the nucleosynthesis picture um, of this outflows actually look like if you look globally at these outflows? So, just for one representative, so in this, just to illustrate this process, uh, and, and Jenny is going to talk about this in, 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 in probably much more detail later on. Um, so I'm, I'm just showing you an example here from our simulations where I'm plotting elemental abundances um, in, this, uh, in this plane of uh, proton number versus, uh, versus neutron number uh, as a function of time. I'll play the movie in a second. And that, it, that captures the elemental abundances of a fluid element, of a uh, representative fluid element that is ejected away from the disk um, in, into the outflows as it undergoes our process nucleosynthesis. So I'm playing this movie now. And as you can see, we start with seed nuclei that are rather here at the center of the valley of uh, stability. So we are still in the sort of disk and, and corona. And then this is sort of uh, oscillating because of the, the turbulence that we see in, the, in these hot coroni. And then at some characteristic temperature of a few gigakelvin, the actual R process sets in. And neutrons capture onto the seed nuclei and form these very heavy exotic elements. And now we run out of a few neutrons. And all these, these uh, strange nuclei have to decay back to the center of the valley of stability to form stable isotopes, uh, thereby producing this characteristic R process abundance pattern that forms all the three R process peaks, the first, the second, and, and the third peak. So this was just for one um, uh, uh, representative fluid trajectory. So um, OK, by the way, I should mention, so in, in so doing, so in, in decaying back to the center of the valley of stability, these nuclei release a lot of uh, uh, nuclear binding energy. Um, each of these nuclei having a different decay time scale, so all these sort of uh, decay time scales uh, superimposed to give a power law that is typically proportional to a time to the minus 1.3. So this is typical power law heating rate that you can see. These are the tracer particles from our simulations, and I'm, I'm sure Jenny will will uh, will take things from here in in, in her talk. Um, so how do how does the nuclear abundance seals actually look like in a in a global perspective? So including all of these outflows, um, so you can see the nuclear synthesis pattern here compared to the uh, observed solar system abundances uh, dotted as red dots here. And as you can see, there's nice agreement. And in particular, irrespective of our treatment of of neutrino absorption or reabsorption, we always get a fairly robust second to third R process peak. So we can produce. The, the second R process peak with silver and so on, and the rare earths, and, and the third peak with platinum and, and, and gold and so on. Um, however, if we include neutrino absorption into, into the analysis, we get a dramatically improved fit also to these uh, lower elemental abundances between the first and second peak. So in essence, uh, this shows that in principle of these disk winds, uh, you could argue you can produce just with a single side 
um, all the upforces elements from the first all the way to the third peak. And this nice agreement is also reflected here in this plot, which shows um, a comparison of our simulation data with um, elemental abundance measurements from uh, metal poor um, uh, stars in the halo of, uh, um, of the Milky Way. So these are relative abundances. So uh, now coming back to um, the total ejector mass. So what does it mean in, in terms of total uh, mass ejected from the system? So with our GIMHD simulations, we find that these winds are, are fairly powerful. They can actually unbind uh, 30 to 40% of the initial disk mass in, in such a system, um, which translates into, uh, if you just assume, say, 35% as a compromise here, and uh, you take our initial disk mass of a few and 10 to minus two solar masses, you essentially end up with a total uh, ejected mass of 10 to the minus two solar masses. And I would even call this a sort of robust lower limit, uh, simply because most accretion disks that we find from binary initial star merger simulations are actually substantially more massive than a few and 10 to the minus two solar masses what we originally started with. So um, I think this, ten, so this essentially shows that these post-merger accretion disks can, can at least produce something of the order of 10 to the minus two solar masses of ejector, which is exactly what you need to explain some of the uh, uh, some of the observations that were made and that we are hearing about in the, in the following talks. This brings me uh, to the conclusions, and maybe David, you, you want to start with your part? Well, okay. <laughs> uh, so my conclusions is, um, well, there are multiple mechanisms driving the dynamical ejection of matter in the first milliseconds of the merger. Uh, the kind of uh, Kilonova signal that you will observe and the kind of abundance patterns that you get depends on uh, the relative importance between these different ingredients, and this in turn depends on the equation of state and on the mass ratios. Um, one important ingredient that needs to be improved in simulation is the treatment of neutrino radiation. And I think this would be really crucial if we want to have a quantitative prediction or a quantitative explanation of the blue component of the kilonova. Uh, one last thing is dynamically ejected from current simulations from any group, not just mine, are not enough especially to explain the, the blue kilonova. We are out of a factor of a few, maybe a factor of two. So this is, I wouldn't say that there is tension at this time. It's very well possible that with corrections to the code and corrections to the models will bring the, these two numbers in agreement. But there is definitely something to investigate there. And Thanks. Well, for the secular detector on much longer time scales, I was trying to convince you that there is a neutrino pool accretion disk that forms that, uh, and that its hot corona drives uh, powerful thermal outflows. We've uh, seen evidence for the self-regulation mechanism that really keeps the YE low, at least in the, in the, in the inner parts of the disk, and, and therefore feeds the, uh, the, the, the outflows with very neutral rich material. Neutrino irradiation is, again, as for the dynamic ejector, very important and crucial to set a self-consistent evolution of the, of the electron fraction, and actually dramatically also improves um, the uh, elemental abundance yields for the, for the lighter uh, elements. Um, as I was uh, showing, uh, these disk winds <coughs> will very likely to be even more massive than a dynamical ejector with typical ejector masses of at least 10 to minus two solar masses. And uh, one discriminating feature is also that these disk winds are typically slower than a dynamic ejector, so we, we typically get ejector velocities of a few percent the speed of light. And taking all this together, uh, this might explain <coughs> Uh, exactly this red component um, of the kilonova that, uh, uh, that, that was observed, but we'll hear much more about the, the observations in the, in the following uh, talks. Thanks. Jerry? Um, <clears throat> you didn't mention any photon processes, and maybe they're unimportant, but what I was thinking of yeah. was in ordinary accretion disks, right. they are, the, you have VAL winds, this secretion is on black holes, right. which are driven by the photons, yeah. and it's on the lines. It's work of Proger and other people. Right, right. Not, so not these disks scatter. Right, exactly. And what I was thinking of is the opacities due to the um, R process elements are so high that the same things would be hundreds of times more effective here. Mm -hmm. So they might compete with the neutrino ones. So. These disks are a little different than the usual accretion disks that we think of in, 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 in many other astrophysical systems, simply by the fact that this material is, is very dense. Um, um, so this is like a 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, 10 to the, up to 10 to the 11 grams per cubic centimeter. So photons are ent entirely trapped 
Um, and the really dominant cooling mechanism here is, is the neutrinos. These are the only particles that sort of can escape and carry uh, energy away from the system. So these winds and, and, and the disk will be well, I'm just thinking okay of the off. very, very high opacities. Did you check it? No, uh, no. We, I mean, we didn't. We didn't do any radiative transfer. Um, it would be worth just taking a quick look at. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, Jerry, it doesn't get to these. Yeah. I'm thinking about the yeah. the outer parts of it. But but still, it's still the outer parts of the wind. Um, I mean, you have to get you have to go really, really, really far until you actually form uh, 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 actual nuclei. Um, uh, this is very dense nuclear matter, uh, which is very different from. From 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 uh, from matter that you would observe in, in typical other accretion based systems. Um, how far are like these two simulations of, from each other in time scale? Are you like almost to the point where you could sort of take over from the disk that forms after the merger, or do you yeah, that's exactly the idea. Set, set up with the Bosch domain. Yeah, so actually what we did for this first simulation, which we published earlier this year, we actually we actually started with an equilibrium torus. But uh, so we convinced ourselves that like after like an early relaxation phase, you actually perfectly mimic the outcomes of, of, uh, of, of binary neutral summer simulation. So if you compare like the location of the maximum density and the disk structure and stuff, they, they actually they look very much the same. Um, but that's exactly the idea that uh, that we take uh, simulations from from actual merger simulations and then continue this with uh, much long-term simulations because we start at these at these uh, uh, dynamical timescales of milliseconds, of course, and then evolve this over very long periods of time. Jules? Yeah. So we also need this disk to uh, to launch a relativistic jet that makes a strong gamma ray emission. <laughs> right. It seems to me that 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 process, which is you know, some, some kind of Blanford's Nyack, uh, right. uh, it's virtually taking place in a, in a vacuum, a very ma little mass loading. Is there some time and place on the disk that, that your model is, allows that to occur? Uh, sure. I mean, in, in principle, we, we could launch a Blanford Nyack uh, jet in here. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, we have magnetic fields in there. So, so far, we, have, we haven't really done a, a, an analysis of, 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 of jet structure or something. But in principle, yes, you can produce a jet in here. And, and, and we might actually have it and, and see it really in the, in the simulation. The, the, only, the only thing that makes me worry a little bit is that in these simulations, we can't really produce it self-consistently. So uh, I think the, the, the more exciting problem is to really study the jet formation from an actual dynamical merger simulation. And, and there's a lot of problems for different reasons to actually um, produce such a jet in, in, in these I mean, simulations. Yeah, I guess but that still, yeah. still requires a lot of work. I mean, know? basically what jet you get out of the accretion disk depends on what magnetic field you put in. The yes. And, and that's sort of, so if we put in an ordered strong magnetic field, we would get a jet. It's yeah. just we wouldn't know if that was what we'd actually expect to be produced in the earlier phase. So we, we can essentially exactly produce one by construction, essentially. By construction of initial data, you can you can essentially produce a jet and, and sort of activate a blank for SNIAC. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember. Just that. Because initial code, you missed it, but is there a black hole in the middle? Yes, there's a black hole, yes. This has to be a black hole. No, so, I, so, if, so th this particular simulation, of course, was done assuming a black hole at the center. So we would sort of assume a, f a sort of rather rapid collapse to, uh, to a black hole, uh, so of this, of this remnant, which might apply to, to this LIGO event. Um, um, but much of this will also, um, of course, carry over to the case of, um, of a central neutral star. And actually, Brian and uh, Rodrigo Fernandez have, have done work on this uh, over the last couple of years. Um, the, the, the only qualitative difference really would be that you have a central source of very strong neutrino radiation, so a few orders of magnitude more than the neutrino radiation that you get from the disk itself. So this central source of neutrino radiation irradiates all these outflows in the disk. And depending on the lifetime of this, uh, of this neutron star, uh, you can actually substantially change uh, the, the YE. So this would be sort of uh, um, a mechanism by which you can get a very blue uh, kilonova from, from that. Or so so yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would even go so far to argue the fact that we see this big red cloud, fairly red purple cloud coming out, um, that we have evidence that there may not have been like a very long of hypermassive right. neutron star. But that needs to be. We need to do better neutrino transport. Uh, to really What's do holding it to the, the material to the disk? The gravity of the disk or the, or the force from the central down object? So you mean like the, how the stratification? Why is it a or? disk? Well, the, the, the angular momentum of the, of the material. So no, the, no, no, the, but the, what is holding it down in the z direction? 
No, no, no. no. It has to be gravity. It is gravity. Right, yeah. It's gravity. But is it yeah. the self gravity? The point of. Oh, it's the central, the central object yes. dominates. So, so the that is a weaker force than it is in the ordinary case. Why? Because the scale height is less. And it goes to sign theta. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's like, I mean, that's the case with normal accretion. Right? So, I mean, maybe I'm missing it. Maybe we should talk to you. Sorry, is it, what's your, point? your point is it because it goes to sign theta? Well, you have a disk because something is pulling it down. Yeah. There's yeah. only two things. There's the self-gravity, yeah. which isn't large with the small mass. Uh -huh. And the gravity, the, the, the z component of the gravity from the central object. Which is what, yeah, that's what. Yes. That's sine theta times the other, right? Yeah. That is less than, that is less than the gravity than an ordinary accretion disk. It's not density that does it. It's less than, why, why is this different than an ordinary accretion Because it's just the scale height is less. Oh, you mean the, nor the normal eta or something? Right. Yeah. So this is this, yeah. this is this is kind of neutrino cooled. I mean, it, it's sort of a th it's like halfway between a thick and a thin disk. So the, the the scale height actually the inner part is, is fairly thin. So it's like 0.1 or 0.2 or something. So it's a fairly thin. We'll discuss it later. Yeah. But uh, uh, maybe remember one more question, then we'll. Uh, so then speaking of the neutrino emission channel, I guess you have a huge magnetic field amplified by the neutron sound merger. Right. There's yeah. another process which is. Uh, between a synchronized mission actually which will dominate because you have a strong magnetic field. Like another mechanism to... Yeah, to which is the, you mean it's the electron interacts with the magnetic field and create a neutrino and a neutrino pair. Oh, okay, that you mean, yeah. okay. And especially in the high temperature, that will scale that like e to the sum like 6 or 7 power. Right, but that is something that you would probably typically assumed to happen in the, the polar funnel, like where the densities are low, so you have a lot of electrons uh, uh, and, and positrons being formed through, like, from photons, and, 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 and they would then produce, uh, yeah. I'm just forcing Z direction. We can talk about it. Yeah. And the, the cooling tends to be negligible in the low density corona regions. It's, it's, it's only so important. important. Yeah. Usually, yeah, I don't think it will change things quantitatively. Okay, um, let's take the seekers again. Yeah. Now we're going to uh, discuss some of the.